So I'm going to talk to you today about Stelfonto, which is a new intratumoral injection that we're using for mast cell tumours. Um, mast cell tumours are very common. It's probably something that you guys are seeing in practice. Have any of you seen many mast cell tumours? Lots of nods. Is anyone here using Stelfonto? Because it is something that's being used in primary care. No? Okay. So we'll go through a little bit about mast cell tumours, and um, what they are, diagnosis and staging. We'll talk about um, Stelfonto, which is tigilinol tiglate. And we'll talk about what we're here for, really, which is nursing the patients that are having Stelfonto. So a little bit about pretreatment and care education. Um, a little bit about what we do on the day and how we use it. And then analgesia and wound care afterwards. And then hopefully, if we have time at the end, we will look at a case study. And this is Millie. So this is one of our first cases that we use Stelfonto on. So to start with, canine mast cell tumours, what are they? So these are the most common skin tumour that we see in dogs. So probably about 20% of the skin tumours that we see in dogs are mast cell tumours. And it's known as the great pretender. And the reason for that is these can look like anything. And I'll show you some photos of what we've seen here in the hospital as mast cell tumours. And you can see it's not an easy diagnosis to make from just looking at a lump. They can range from nearly benign to quite malignant, just depending on the grade. Um, so again, it's important to stage them properly. And they arise from the mast cells, and the mast cells are a part of the normal immune response in the body. So when we get proliferation of these cells, then that becomes a tumour and that becomes a problem for us. Now mast cells, as I said, they're part of the immune response, but they also have an allergic and inflammation role. Um, and these tumours do secrete lots and lots of different um, Things um, including histamine and heparin, and this is why we get generally with mast cell tumours, if they're quite malignant, if they're quite aggrieved, um, they can cause quite a lot of problems in the body. So mast cell tumours, what do we see them in? What breeds? So generally we will see um, across the range of breeds, but there are some more breeds that are more likely to get them. So golden retrievers certainly, and a lot of the bull breeds. The good news is that when we see them in the bull breeds, they're actually often less aggressive. So we might see these, but they might be a lower intermediate grade tumour. Um, we do know there's some underlying genetic link. What that is, we don't know, but obviously because we're seeing it through certain breeds and certainly we're seeing patients that have had mast cell tumours and previous um, pets in those families have had mast cell tumours, there's got to be some underlying genetic link there. They do tend to be in older patients, um, but they can be any age. And we've had one two-year-old dogs here with mast cell tumours. And as I said, they can be seen in any breed. So these are really the ninjas of the tumour family. So they can look like anything. They can be in any size, any site. They might wax and wane in size. So we might see a tumour and we'll say to the carer, how long has that been there? And they say, well, it was there this week, last week it wasn't, two months ago there it was there again, so they get bigger and smaller. We might see single or we might see multiple, and they're all separate mast cell tumours generally if there's multiple. They're not metastasis from one mast cell tumour. They might be itchy, they might be uncomfortable, because we've got this heparin and histamine response, that might be quite uncomfortable for that patient, and they might be soft and fleshy and they might look like lipoma. And that's why we really need to FNA these tumours and make sure that we know what's going on. So often when we FNA these, they will increase in size and they bleed, and that's known as Darrier's sign. So they'll become quite erythematous. We might find it a bit harder to stop them bleeding. And usually if we FNA a tumor here or a mass here, and we see them get bigger, we'll see them bleed a little bit. We often know from the start that that's a mast cell tumor. Obviously we still need to check with the lab. Um, and we do get this histamine release. So we get swelling, we get itchiness, we can get really, extreme signs with these if you um, aggravate them too much, if you manipulate them too much. So we can get vomiting, diarrhea, edema, pyrexia, collapse, and we can get gastric ulceration again due to the histamine secreting excess gastric acid. And when we get degranulation of these tumours, so again they're aggrieved, they get very upset and they degranulate, so they release all these substances, we can get hypertension and this can be life-threatening. So if you get all these symptoms, you can actually get a patient that's very, very unwell indeed. So this is some examples of, of mast cell tumours that we've seen in a hospital. As you can see, this one's just a little skin lesion on the mouth, kind of on the muzzle of a golden retriever. 
This is actually lymph node metastasis. So this is the inguinal lymph node of a Jack Russell. The mastal tumor was actually on the hock, um, which was quite small, but this metastasis is huge and quite upsetting for the patient. This again, just a little lump, quite soft and fleshy, looked like a lipoma, was a mast cell tumor. Again, I don't know if you can see too well, but again, a little lump here on this dog here. And then on the far side there, that's quite an extensive skin rash and bruising. And that again, when we FNA, that came back as mast cell tumor. And that dog was very, very unwell in the hospital. So diagnosis of these guys. So these are quite distinctive on cytology. Um, we see small to medium round cells. They stain purplish, so we've got all these little granules. Um, but bear in mind that if you're not getting those granules, it doesn't mean it's not a mast cell tumor. So some do not stain easily. They need to go to the lab. They need additional staining. So if in doubt, send them to the lab. They'll tell you what's going on. And this is a typical mast cell tumor. So this is one we've had in in the past month. You've got all these little granules here. You've got, see all these little speckles? Um, so that's a mast cell tumor. And we know at this stage when we stick this under the microscope that that's a mast cell tumor. So mast cell tumors, what we want to look at first is what do we have? We've diagnosed this as mast cell tumor and then we need to look at where they spread to. So with mast cell tumors, generally they will spread to the regional lymph nodes first and then they will spread to the liver and spleen. It's unlikely that these guys spread to the thorax. So actually most of the time we don't bother doing chest x-rays because it's very unlikely that you're going to get um, any kind of pulmonary mets, uh, anything like that. We will sometimes x-ray the chest if we're looking for lymph nodes. So we're looking for the tracking lymph nodes. Now this diagram shows where a lump might track to, so which lymph node it might track to. So in theory, you've got a lump here, it's gonna spread to your inguinal lymph nodes. Um, you've got a lump here, it's gonna spread to your popliteal. This is a beautiful diagram, but it's not always true. So um, it can be quite tricky. Sometimes we'll have a tumor that's here and it's actually spread to an axillary lymph node. So it's quite tricky to figure out where those lymph nodes or where those tumors track to. And generally we will do sentinel lymph node mapping. So we'll inject some contrast into a tumor and then it will track to the lymph node. And then we'll have a look on CT and see where that's tracked to. So staging, this is the next thing that we need to do. So we need to look at where else in the body it is. So minimum database with these patients, again, if they're a bit older, we'll want to check bloods, we'll want to check um, urinalysis, make sure there's nothing concurrent going on. As I said, we assess the local lymph nodes and then we will do abdominal ultrasound and we will always FNA the liver and spleen, even if they look normal. So they may look completely normal on ultrasound and they may contain mast cells anyway. So it's always important to FNA these unless you know you're dealing with a very low grade tumor. It is usual to see some mast cells. Remember, they're part of the allergic response, the immune response in the body. So generally the lab will say some mast cells seen, but not anything proliferating, not anything concerning with these guys. So what now? We've diagnosed these, we've staged them, we know where it is. What are we looking at for treatment? So um, generally with, with mast cell tumors, our first line of treatment is going to be surgery. Um, and then we'll go with adjunctive chemotherapy. So we want to remove as much of the tumor as possible and then go ahead with chemotherapy. Um, radiotherapy is also an option. It's not something we do in this hospital. We just don't have the facilities. But again, it's an option for mast cell tumors. Electrochemotherapy, again, something we've started to, to get in here, but it's not available everywhere. And then we have the intratumoral injection, which is called Stelfonta, which is tegilinol tiglate. And that's fairly new in the market. It's probably here a couple of years at this stage. Um, and we've used it on a few cases. So this is it here. Um, it's a, an injection that's injected directly into the tumor, but there are quite strict criteria to use this on license. So first, we have to have a non-resectable tumor. So if we have a tumor that's easy to resect, so it's maybe on the chest wall that we can take off easily with good margins, it's not really going to be a candidate for Stelfonta in theory. Um, we want these to be non-metastatic, so we need to stage our patients. We need to check those lymph nodes, we need to check the liver and spleen, because if they are metastatic, they are not suitable for this. And then for the type of tumour, so if we've got a subcutaneous mast cell tumour, it's only licensed for on or distal to the hock or the elbow. And this is just the licensing that they've had um, when they first did trials on it. Cutaneous tumours, anywhere, so that's not an issue. And then there's a max volume of tumor. So that's eight centimeters cubed, which is the height by the width, by the length, by a half. Um, this is 
a calculation that the Stealth Honda website actually can do for you if you just input the, the details so you don't have to kind of remember that. Um, interestingly, in the US, the max volume is actually 10 centimeters cubed. Um, it's just whatever licensing they've had there is slightly different. So this is kind of our general timeline for this drug. Um, day one, we inject we get this acute inflammatory response. So we get this oncolytic effect, and I'll show you on the next slide what that looks like. And then between day and one day seven, sorry, between day one and day seven, so generally around day three to seven, we get necrotic destruction. So we'll get blackening, we'll get shrinkage, we get discharge, and then generally around day seven to 10, the tumor actually drops off, so it leaves quite a big skin defect. By day 28, we've got about half of the wounds fully healed. Day 42, we've got 76%. And then by day 84, you've got 97%. Bear in mind that a lot of these tumors are on very odd areas. So maybe on the hock, on the paw, they're gonna have a lot of movement. So generally our wound delay on these is actually more because of that than you know, the drug itself. So this is what it looks like. Um, thanks to Verbach for sending me across the slides. So, so it shows you here prior to treatment, um, we've got a very small tumor that we've injected into and we start getting this swelling, this bruising. Day one to three, it's looking quite a kind of ugly and purple. And then we get this tumor necrosis. So it goes black, it shrinks, and then eventually drops off, leaving a defect. These can be quite scary looking, the defects, and this is something we'll talk about in terms of nursing and preparing pet carers. And then this complete response, you get the site fully healed. So actually they look quite scary, but they do heal really well. So as nurses, what do we need to know? So we'll talk a bit about pre-treatment. We'll talk about preparing our pet carers, um, the day of treatment, and then analgesia and wound care. So pre-treatment medications. So all of our patients that have this drug need to go on concurrent medications. So we give them H1 blockers, generally something like chlorophenamins, so antihistamines, H2 blockers to help with the gastric acid secretion. So famotidine is usually the one that we'll use. And then we use some steroids as well. And this is all to prevent that degranulation effect that we get when we anger a mast cell tumor. So bear in mind, we're injecting something into it to kill it. It's not going to be particularly happy about that. So we need to have these medications on board. So I'll show you a medication diary um, and how we give these, but generally we start two days before we give the injection. It's really important that the carer gives these medications and we carry on till day eight afterwards. So we really need to prepare our pet carers. As I said, you're going to have a significant defect there. Um, from the tumor and we can have a very small tumor and a very big defect because it takes all the tumor tissue So remember that a tumor is not just what you can see it actually has little tendrils going out and hopefully The stealth onto will kill all those little tendrils of tumor But you do end up with a big gap where you should have skin. So it's quite scary sometimes and um, the website is really good. It's really informative. It's got lots of case studies so I would suggest having a look at that um, and we can do things like there's stealth onto diaries, there's medication charts, and really have a discussion with the carer. So I would say go through the website with them, have a look at the case studies, discuss what you might see. Um, it's really important to do this, but it's also quite handy to do it when they come to collect their medications. So you can make sure that they're happy with how to give the medications and then also at the same time, what to expect from this injection. And this is where we're really good as RVNs. We have the time to do it, we have the bond with the carer, and we can explain things really well, I think. These are the little Stelfonta diaries. Um, if anyone wants to see, see one, I've got some downstairs, I can pull them upstairs. Um, we do get them from Verabac, um, so they're the company that um, manufacture Stelfonta here in the UK. Um, so they will go through the medications, they go through some case studies, and they give some additional information about mast cell tumors. Medication charts, something we can do really, really easily on Excel. This is just an Excel spreadsheet, lots of pretty colors, perfect. So make it as easy as possible. So even though the diaries have this kind of thing day by day, they'll have what, what medication to give. I would advise that you do something like this as well. Our carers love to throw them on the fridge and they just tick them as they do them. So. Um, as I said, we start with the steroids, so we start from day minus two, so every 12 hours, and then bear in mind towards kind of day, what's that, day eight, we start SID instead of BID. And then we start our H1 and our H2 blocking agents on the morning of injection, so again, every 12 hours, and we continue that through until afterwards. And then analgesia, I've put as needed, but it is something that you want to think about in advance because most of these patients will need some analgesia. Um, treatment day, so preparation, we need to make sure our patient's starved. 
we sedate all our patients here for Stelfonta. It is something that on the website they will say, if you can FNA, you can give Stelfonta without sedation. It stings, they don't love it, they're in strange areas, and actually if we accidentally self-inject with this, it can cause necrosis of our own skin. So I wouldn't advise it, to be honest. Um, I would really try and sedate these patients if possible. We want to make sure we've got informed consent as always, and we want a good deep sedation plan. Make sure your carers have given their medications so that they've given it two days prior, because obviously if they haven't, we don't want to give this injection because you could risk an anaphylactic or a degranulation reaction. Analgesia, so again, we want to talk about that and have that as part of our sedation plan and re-measure our tumours. So sometimes when we put these guys on steroids, the tumour will reduce in size. Um, sometimes it will have gotten bigger, but we need to measure them to find out how much of the stealth wants to use. And then we clip and prepare these. So you will see in this, this is quite a small clip. This is actually a clip that we just did to, to show where the tumour was, but I would do a huge clip around this. Make sure that you've got enough space if the tumour necroses a huge amount of tissue that you've got that skin already clipped. And then we just prepare as you would a surgical site, so just some chlorhexidine, something like that. Administration, so they say to take the drug out of the fridge because it stings less. So we do that about an hour in advance and we use Lorlox syringes. Um, that's to prevent us kind of having anything bursting out of the hub to prevent leakage because we don't want to be in contact with this drug ourselves. Um, we want to wear PPE, so we will wear goggles and we'll wear gloves. Um, just again to prevent getting this into our mucous membranes um, and we'll use chemo gloves which are slightly thicker. And then the injection technique. So in theory you inject kind of into the tumour and then you fan out to get as much of the, the liquid kind of into the outside of the tumour as possible. So you don't come back out, you kind of try and reposition the needle as you're in. Um, it's quite difficult with some of these small tumours. So this is a tumour on the ear of a boxer. It's a tiny tumour, you can see we're using an insulin syringe, it's so much so little um, of the stealth onto that we're using. So that one, it's a bit, you know, you hope that you've found it out, but it's quite hard to actually make sure of that. Then post-treatment, we really want to be careful with leakage. So if we can cover these, we will. So we'll pop a Primapore on. Again, if you've got one on the face, if you've got one on the ear, it's not necessarily going to stay on. So we just need to warn people not to touch the area. Um, we have these little signs that we put in the kennel door. So it just says, these guys are on concurrent medications. Um, you know, you might get bruising, you might get swelling, you might get necrosis, because that's quite scary, obviously, for wards to see, um, and then not to touch the tumour site. So we keep them in for the afternoon, and then we send them home once they're awake enough to go home. And then we get wards really on board in terms of if you feel this patient needs more analgesia, let us know. And then obviously we discharge to the, to the pet carer. Analgesia-wise, we need to remember that these patients are on other medications, so they're on steroids. We don't want them on NSAIDs. The other thing is that with our histamine response from our mast cell tumours, you can get gastric ulceration because you get more secretion of gastric acid. So you might not want them on NSAIDs anyway because you're already running the risk or a higher risk of getting an ulcer. Um, so we need to think kind of multimodal, really. So certainly in terms of um, pre-medications or sedations, look at things like methadone, look at dexmedetomidine, um, ketamine, and then going home, paracetamol is great, gabapentin, anything like that. Um, so have a look at a multimodal plan for these patients. And then communicate with the carers because they really need to let you know if they feel their pet is uncomfortable um, because you want to get on board in terms of analgesia as soon as possible. Uh, Post-operatively, so again, hopefully we'll have this previous preparation. They'll be quite on board for, you know, when the tumour does drop off, they don't get a fright. E-collar versus no e-collar. People are so used to being told to put a buster collar on that when you tell them not to put a buster collar on, they get a fright. So with these tumours, actually, we're told by the company that it's okay to lick. That's quite scary for most people. They don't want to be told... <sighs> They don't want to be told that it's okay to lick. They get worried that the dog is going to pull their skin apart. So sometimes you do need to say to, um, you know, if at night they want to put the buster collar on, that's fine. And then they can do some supervised licking. That's absolutely fine, whatever keeps them happy. And then post-operative checks and photographs. So ask them to send you through photographs even daily if they can. And you can just keep an eye and reassuring, reassure them that things are fine. And then educate other practices or other colleagues that will be involved because if you see a dog come in with a wound like this on their foot, they're going to debride that, they're going to flush it. 
they're probably going to clip it. To be fair, they might be right to clip it because that's a very poor clip. We didn't realize how big this defect was going to be. Um, but they're going to get a fright. They're going to put this dog on antibiotics. And actually, in the trials that they've done, most of the wounds healed perfectly well by second intention with no further intervention. So we'll just talk a little bit through um, a case study in our last few minutes. Um, so this is Millie. So she's a seven-year-old female neutered Cocker Spaniel. She's quite an anxious girl. She's from a rescue background. Um, we've made friends over the past month, but she, when she first came in, was quite worried. And she had a right carpal mast cell tumour, so that had previously been surgically excised um, and then come back at the same site. So that was confirmed by us on FNA. So initially, we had a look at the tumour. We staged her. She was non-metastatic. Blood tests, nothing going on. And then in terms of the location where it was in the carpus, yeah, we could have gotten it off surgically, but we would have had quite a big defect there. We might have had to do a graft. Now, for quite an anxious patient who hates being in the hospital, a skin graft, multiple bandage changes, multiple kind of occasions of having more handling, um, it's not ideal for a patient like this. So because there was such a question mark over it being surgical, we actually decided to go ahead with Stelfonta for this dog. We measured the tumour, so 1.5 by 1.7 by 1 centimetres. Um, and then pre-procedure, we went through all that kind of care and education with the carer. So she came in for her treatment. We re-measured the tumour. It had actually gotten bigger, but we're still within. So we're under that 8 centimetres cubed, so it's absolutely fine. We checked that the carer had given her medications. Really good carer, this. She had written all her details in the Stelfonta diary. She was keeping track of what was going on. So really invested, really nice lady. And then we sedated. So initially, so this was one of our first Stelfonta cases. So we gave dexmedetomidine and butorphanol. We actually ended up topping up this analgesia because of where the tumor was on the foot. We found that as we were going to inject, the dog was actually twitching, not a good enough sedation. So we added some alfaxalone just to, to get her asleep enough and we topped up her analgesia with some buprenorphine. So then actually she went towards and she was still painful. Again, with an anxious dog, you always want, wonder, is it painful or is it behavioral? But you really just don't want to kind of risk it. If they are painful or if you think they might be painful, give them more analgesia. So we actually gave her some ketamine um, as a subcut injection, and then her paw started to swell. Again, quite scary looking, but this is normal for this um, location. So she was non-weight bearing going home. Um, we did a full handover to the wards team, and then we discharged her on some paracetamol. We asked the carer to keep in touch. So we booked her in for rechecks at one week, four week, and then monthly. Um, but actually we ended up, I got a phone call from the carer the next day saying, I'm worried about how this looks. She sent me through a photo and we actually sent her back to her own vets for some more analgesia. So this is what it looked like when she called me. So day of injection, absolutely fine. Little red area here where we've injected. And then day one, this is a carer who is slightly concerned that this foot is going to fall off. So very bruised, very sore looking, but this is just Stelfonta doing its job. So more analgesia, keep her comfortable, don't touch the leg. We said to the carer, you've got an anxious dog anyway, don't, don't fight with her, don't, you know, don't give her any occasion to snap. If she's painful, we'll get her more analgesia, we'll keep her happy. And then actually by day five, all that swelling's calmed down. We've got this little necrotic area here, so this is where our tumour tissue is, and that is going to drop off. So then day eight, as you can see, it has dropped off. Um, you do see some reports of these where the tumours drop off and the dogs eat the tissue. Nothing to worry about. Very disgusting, but nothing to worry about. It's not toxic to them. So, um, yeah, if you do see them, it is absolutely awful, but it's fine. So that was day eight. And then actually day 29, you see we've just this little scab on the back of the foot. Excuse the not great photo. Um, but that healed up beautifully. So really nice outcome for this dog. Really nice outcome for the carer because apart from that one day in the hospital and then some visits in to get lots of treats and us to have a quick look at the foot, there was very, very minimal handling for this dog. So really nice outcome for them. So really when we talk about this drug, um, the recap really is to first make sure your tumour is suitable so that you have that, those criteria, so non-metastatic in the correct areas, non-surgical. Prepare your pet carers, so make sure that they are prepared for a big lump of tissue to come off for a skin defect. Remember that we need these concomitant medications, so that's really, really important. If they don't have them, they're not having the injection. 
and then really think multimodal analgesia. So including the pre-med and any subsequent cases we've used after that, actually we've put more analgesia on board, we've used more things like methadone and we've really kept them as comfortable as possible. And then post-operative wound care. So remember to really direct the carer. Things like, you know, they're allowed to lick. The more they lick actually in terms of the <coughs> studies that they've done, the more that tumor, necrotic tumor tissue comes off and the quicker that wound will heal. So that's obviously something that we're as nurses not used to saying, let them lick. So it's, it's important to steer our carers through that. And also to tell them that it's just for this drug, not in general, it's not fine to lick otherwise. So those are the main nursing considerations really.